Hello, and welcome again to another program of Searching for Answers. We would encourage you to get your Bibles and gather around, whether you're listening or watching us on television, and let's go to Chapter 5 in the book of 1 Corinthians. On my right is... Richard Rice, Loma Linda University. And John Jones, La Sierra University. Ivan Blazin, Loma Linda University. And I'm Carolyn Thompson. I think we'll begin by reading the first verse in chapter five, and I'm going to ask my very good friend, Ivan Blazin, to open for us. Well, this is quite a verse to, to start out with. Yes, it is. <laughs> Paul says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not found even among the pagans. Mm. For a man is living with his father's wife. That's wow. the first verse. That's pretty bad. That is amazing, isn't it, in a Christian congregation? Yeah. I, I think, Ivan, we, we should at least uh, catch the follow-up sentence there in yeah. the next verse. Well, you want me to continue? Or sure, you, you go continue? ahead. And you are arrogant. Should you not rather have mourned so that he who has done this would have been removed from among you? Yeah. Mm. You've got to wonder what this arrogance is, don't you? Mm -hmm. But um, it, it may be that what we need to understand this sort of pride about this whole thing, this boastfulness about it, uh, helps us maybe if we check in the next chapter, chapter mm. 6, <coughs> verse 12. Okay. Because here Paul is quoting uh, one of the slogans of the people who, to whom he's writing. And um, some of our uh, reader, uh, readers, hearers, listeners, viewers in their Bible will have quotes around the versions they're looking at, huh? where it says, all things are lawful for me. This is apparently a slogan of one of the groups in the church who are celebrating their newfound freedom in Christ. Mm -hmm. And it's that wonderful release from constraint that um, just is such a tremendous uh, kind of breath of fresh air in their lives that they celebrate all things, all things, everything. God created all. It's all for us. It's all ours. You know, all things are lawful for me. And it may be that that is part of the same attitude that we've got at work in the congregation in verse 2 who are even saying, and guess what? You know, we're not even hung up by the hang-ups, you know, yeah. of, the, of the pagan people. We, we float above all of that. We're so transcendent above it all. Well, and they think, going along with what you said, they think of themselves as the wise. Yeah. We have a right. superior spirit-given wisdom, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so we can do all things. And they are the spiritual. Yeah. They think of themselves as spiritual. We are so transcendently spiritual, it's as if, and, and later on, we'll, I think we'll argue this, they already think that they, they don't need a future resurrection of the body because they're yeah. already resurrected within their spiritual selves. Yeah. They're on high. They judge all things. Let me tell you uh, what I'm seeing in my Bible here, yeah. uh, where you started. Um, chapter 6, verse 12. Yeah. The very first thing they say, someone will say, I'm allowed to do anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that wild? Anything. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> what are well, they talking that means anything about? in Christ. You know, I mean, I, I, because I'm... This is the I'm freedom of the free. gospel, see? So, yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's exactly what's going on. You're, you're right, Carolyn. You've captured the, the attitude. These people, we must remember, Christianity mm -hmm. is, a, is a new religion. Mm -hmm. It's an infant religion. Their faith is infant faith. And they're trying to figure out what Christianity really means. The problem is to get it located in the spectrum between law on the one <laughs> hand and release on the other hand. Where in between does it really fall? Yeah. And so they're, they're trying out a few things here, so to speak, that uh, I think you're right, Ivan. I think, I think that they see themselves as already actualizing and realizing the kingdom here and now in their lives. Absolutely. This is, an, this is a realized eschatology, to use a fancy word, but it means that the end, 
is right here and we've already kind of gotten past it and we're free from the judgment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, he says to them in one place, already you are reigning right. as kings. Right. And then right. inviting Sarkhan, yeah. would to God that you did reign so that we yeah. poor apostles yeah. Yeah. might reign with you, yeah. almighty <laughs> Corinthians. Well, chapter 6, yeah. verse 1 again says, if one of you has a dispute with a fellow Christian, how dare he go before heathen judges instead of letting God's people settle the matter? Yeah. Don't you know that God's people will judge the world? Mm -hmm. Well then, if you are to judge the world, aren't you capable of judging small matters? This is yeah, evident right. yeah, in the right. church, don't you think? Yeah, right. Yeah, well, right. It, there are two things about these these two issues that impress me. One mm -hmm. is that uh, Paul really does get down to the nitty gritty <coughs> of life's problems. Yes. Uh, sometimes we th may think that the Bible sort of speaks to us on a spiritual plane that soars above the sordid, and it doesn't. It really deals with concrete problems and problems of a sort that makes some of us a little uncomfortable talking about in a, in a religious setting because we think that mm -hmm. we ought to, it ought to be primarily with spiritual things. So I appreciate the fact that Paul is addressing concrete human <coughs> problems in a straightforward way. The other thing that impresses me is that Paul is profoundly concerned about the the cohesiveness of the Christian community. Yeah. And on the one hand, he wants to eliminate the divisions that are tending to fragment the Christian community there in Corinth. And we've already looked at these uh, in past uh, our past discussions. But the other is to recognize that there are certain forms of behavior that will just totally disintegrate the thing. And they're, yeah. they're, I, I don't think Paul is trying to push people out. Mm -hmm. He wants to keep it together. But at the same time, there's certain forms of, of behavior, certain misunderstandings of Christianity that if they become pervasive, the whole basis of the community will be gone. Right. And I, it looks like here are a couple of them. I mean, well, one is, this, is... Is this Paul speaking in chapter 5? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's Paul okay, saying, look, I've, I've heard, I've heard uh, something that yeah. you're tolerating yeah. that simply uh, is, is going to cause the breakdown of the community, is going to bring the church into scandal within the surrounding yeah. world. And... You just have to make a statement here. Yeah. Now, I, I think we may go on to read that he's not condemning this particular individual to uh, eternal perdition. He's sleeping. Well, with we'll want to see. What he says. <laughs> we'll see. That's what he says. But rather, it's a matter of uh, of wanting him to understand the what mm -hmm. would you say the gravity of mm -hmm. his own spiritual yeah. situation. Mm -hmm. So, if he thinks everything's fine as he's uh, kind of evidently telling himself, anything I do is lawful because I'm, after all, a spiritual being. And free in Christ. Yeah. Free in Christ, mm -hmm. he misunderstands the nature of freedom yeah. in Christ. Well, and he needs, a, let, he uh, needs a wake-up call. Let me go to the Good News Bible. Now I'll start chapter 5 again. Yeah, please do. And then you, you I'll say, make a comment here. Now it is actually being said that there is sexual immorality among you so terrible that not even the heathen would be guilty of it. I am told that a man is sleeping with his stepmother. How then can you be proud? On the contrary, you should be filled with sadness, and the man who has done such a thing should be expelled from your fellowship. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask you to comment. Well, first of all, one of the big questions with Corinthians is, will Christ the Christ that the Corinthians believe in, will this Christ as actualized in their lives, will he change the culture or will the culture change the church? Mm -hmm. But now we've got something where not even the culture, Paul is saying, approves of this. That's right. You're way beyond even cultural norms because we know from some of the great uh, thinkers of the time, Greco-Roman thinkers, they wouldn't have approved of no, this. They right. would have railed against this. Yes. But this church is doing it. Where on earth did they ever get this idea, except, I think, this idea that you were mentioning? We are floating up above and beyond. Yes. We have mm -hmm. wisdom. We're spiritual. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry about concerns like this at all. Yeah, I think that's exactly what's See, going on. That's yeah. it. Would you continue reading? Sure. Now the question arises, where do we go from here? What Paul, in effect, says, here's what... Here's, Verse 2. Here, Here's what we do. Yeah, verse 2. You're proud. You're arrogant. You should have been mourning rather than celebrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now, verse 3. 
here's where we go from here. So, though absent in body, I am present in spirit. Uh, this is interesting because Paul is very holistic in mm -hmm. a way, isn't mm -hmm. he? Uh, he? He, in later, uh, at, toward the close of his letter in chapter 15, he's going to argue that body and spirit rise and fall together and yeah. that in the hereafter, the only way we inherit uh, eternity is in the body. So Paul sees them together. But in this paragraph, uh, he starts off with body and spirit uh, separately. And in dealing with this man in verse 5, body and spirit or flesh and spirit are going to come up again in a way that is rather surprising. So let's see what we can make of it. Okay. Yeah, I may be absent in body. He, you mm -hmm. know, I'm writing you from Ephesus. Huh? Mm -hmm. But I'm still with you in spirit. And, uh, and as if present, I've already pronounce judgment, just the same as if I've been with you. Could, could I just make a footnote yeah. to what you just yeah, quoted? Yeah, yeah. I remember as a kid, you know, it would be customary sometimes for us to look for cigarettes or even cigarette. I hate to tell you this, cigarette butts or something like, to, to kind of smoke them. I kind of hate for you to tell us this too. I, I don't like to I tell you this. I can't picture this. Can this you? is like, this is the Confessions of Augustine. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <See>? <laughs> I can't even picture but this. But I'm illustrating something <laughs> here actually. Go I may ahead. have forgotten the illustration. But anyway, so, <laughs> so I, I, I light up. And then I see suddenly one of the, my friend's fathers there, oh, oh, oh. and I immediately thought of my father. Yeah. And it ended that smoke right on the spot. Yeah. My father was as if he were there, mm -hmm. you know. I knew how he would feel about yeah. such a thing. So I can understand Paul saying, you know, I'm present with you in the spirit. My dad was present with me in spirit. His sure attitude, was. his sure, perspective, sure, sure, sure. his dislike of anything like this. Yeah. So. I kind of tune in on yeah. Paul here. Mm -hmm. So there's, mm -hmm. Paul is their spiritual father, you know, yeah. and he's serious about it. So he really um, does want to, to kind of hook in, Ivan, just as that did in your experience. Yeah, you know? uh, yeah look, it's as if I were, was right there with you. Mm -hmm. yes. You know what I would say. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So, so now, but it's not in Paul's name. Nonetheless, his presence is important spiritually, but really, mm -hmm. verse 4, yeah, it's the name of the Lord Jesus. Yeah, you pr I have pronounced uh, judgment. judgment on him, this man who has, has behaved in this way, done such a thing. And so, therefore, now, hear how you proceed. When you are assembled, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Well, that is interesting, isn't it? That's right. This is our earliest reference to an act of excommunication or disfellowship. That's right. Yeah. But what does he say, spirit and body? Why does he? Why doesn't he keep them together? Yeah, that's you know, what I was what? hinting at a second ago. All right, this go is ahead. a puzzle. This is interesting. Well, uh, it's going to yeah, be a okay. challenge, I think. So <laughs> I'm anxious to hear how our New Testament <laughs> scholars deal with it. Well, this. the commentators have spilled a good deal of ink over this with a variety of explanations. Um, um, I, Ivan, I'll uh, invite you to chime in on this, but uh, the destruction of the flesh, it is not altogether clear whether that is in the last day or whether um, he is being somehow abdicated to Satan so that in his fleshly living that that might be burned out or destroyed even here and now in this life. Yeah, I first think, of all, I really yeah. think that it, that it does refer to this life yeah, now. Not merely the last judgment. Yeah, not merely mm -hmm. that. So that the flesh may be destroyed. So I think the idea, isn't it, that yeah. the, the, this is sort of, allow me to use this word, an apocalyptic uh, picture that we're having here. Uh, the church is like a... a an island of sanity mm -hmm. and of spirituality in a sea of paganism. Mm -hmm. Pagans are all over mm -hmm. the place. Mm -hmm. And that's the domain mm -hmm. where Satan holds uh, sway. sway. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so mm -hmm. if you hand this man, if you send this man out of the church, he necessarily goes into Satan's domain. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. what Paul says, though, is he doesn't want something terrible to happen. He wants that entity called flesh. Mm -hmm. which for Paul is self-will, mm -hmm. arrogance, mm -hmm. the autonomy of the self. Mm -hmm. He wants that to be knocked out so that something better, you know, spirit dependence, you might say, might take place. Yeah. So he has a redemptive purpose in mind 
for sending this man forth. He mm -hmm. wants him to find his way back. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I saw a TV program t one time. These parents were, they, they couldn't understand their own kids, teenage kids. They were incorrigible, it seemed. And one mother said, look, we just have to sometimes let them go, let them practice their thing, and that's the only thing that might give them a chance to come to their senses. Yeah. Look at the guy in Luke 15. He, mm -hmm. he leaves his dad, mm -hmm. his father gets the inheritance. Yeah, gets his inheritance and said, Dad, I want my money now. Yeah. I want to live the good life. Right. So he goes so out there. So he says, there. okay, go. Yeah. Here's the money. That's right. And then the parable says when he's in a pig pen, when he came to himself, so, he yes, suddenly, yes. a realization yes. came. I've been out of my mind. I've been insane all this time. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to my father. I think this is sort of like the idea behind this. Well, I, just to see if I understand what you're saying, Ivan, that the word flesh here does, is not a reference to some sort of physical, no. material he doesn't want to reality. be reality. It's, it's rather a description of a state of being. Exactly. For Paul, flesh refers to, say, the person in sin apart from Christ. Right. And so that would apply, let's say, to the prodigal son who's left. Yeah. And now he's living a life uh, by different principles. Right. And it leads to, shall we say, a kind of a, a self-destruction there. He comes to himself and returns. So yeah. here, in a sense, if, if there's some application there, Paul is saying, okay, the destruction of the kind of life he's really living and doesn't fully realize, and once that destruction takes place, he may find himself back yes. if he follows I the spirit yes. into a different sort of principle of living. Am I right? So yeah, it's, he'll not be a, it's not a material versus an immaterial reality. It's rather yeah. life dominated by sort of conventional... Uh, human understanding exactly. versus life dominated by or saturated with a spiritual understanding. Yeah. Do, do I have that yeah, right? No, I so think, it's, I it's think not physical versus non-physical, no. but worldly versus kingdom. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. We don't need to make Paul slavish about his use of language. Uh, everyone deserves a right to have a little wiggle room and flexibility, but it does seem to me that Romans 7 really uh, parallels in his use of the terminology. So. In, in 725, famous passage, we all know it, uh, 725, with my mind I'm a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh I'm a slave to the law of sin. And again, I think Paul basically means not simply within my, car, within my body. Within this stuff yeah, here. Yeah, that's right. But rather that uh, when, when my uh, attention is distracted by the normal kind of human way of seeing and being, yeah, I, uh, I, f I find myself enslaved again uh, under um, my carnal drives. You know? That's right, mm -hmm. that's right. So it's the principle. Well, give us your take on this. Well, I think flesh for Paul is normal, wh what should we say? Human life apart yeah. from Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Life that's dominated by the concerns of this world and it, it may lead this person to do terrible things but it also refers to people who are self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can, you can be living according to the flesh and be very successful by worldly standards. So it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a way of talking about, like Ivan said, a realm of living or a frame of mind yeah. or a state of being. Maybe that's the best way. It's a certain state of being that's dominated by, by the powers of sin. Doesn't Paul say to them, sin. why don't you throw this man out? Well, I yeah, think he what does. He, <laughs> yeah, he says that. Yes. Have you done that yet? And then he goes on to say, from what I think he's saying, I, it's kind of hard for me to interpret this, but uh, you could bring him back spiritually. Did you get that far? On? I think that as I, hear, as I hear what our colleagues here are saying, the mm -hmm. answer is yes. In other mm -hmm. words, something has to get, get his through attention. Mm -hmm. to this fellow yes. mm -hmm. so that he understands the gravity of his situation. Right. And to let him just be a part of the community, to uh, treat him as if everything was just fine, and let him continue to assume that this is just okay with everybody else, so it must be with God, would be to do him a great disservice. So yes. occasionally, yeah. you, have to t you have to care enough to tell people the very worst. Well, the witness of the church is destroyed otherwise. Right. I remember once uh, a pastor of, a, of an important church asked me, um, what I thought about this, there was a fellow in the church who was, uh, had 
uh, a number of women on the hook at the same time. And they all thought that he really cared and loved them. And he was uh, very affectionate to them, but not only to one. And then they began to discover, you know, later on, that we have been hoodwinked. He's going all around the place. So the question is what to do. Well, there was only one thing to do. For the good of that congregation, that fellow had to be removed from that congregation. He had to be said, you know, leave. You have to go. You can't fellowship here. You're ruining the life of the church. Yeah. And of so, the women. And of the women. Well, now there's that, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks for putting it well, so strongly. It was right. That's right. No, you're right. right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so there comes a time when you have to remove. Some people are offended by this, that Paul would use such stringent language, but he, he uses it for a good purpose. He says, not even the heathen do what, you, what this man is doing. No, that's right. And you realize that this <coughs> is uh, it's outlawed. It's his father's wife. Well, it's outlawed in Levitic Leviticus 18. You're not spo ha supposed to have relationships with any kind of family members. And one of them is but those your mother-in-law didn't read in those days, Your did stepmother. they? <coughs> well, the scriptures sounded forth, the message was given. Even if they didn't read, they could hear it. Somebody yeah, gave hear it. Yeah, hear it in the synagogue, yeah. Yeah, so your boasting is not a good thing, verse 6. That really hooks back in with 5-2. You are arrogant. Mm -hmm. You are puffed up. There are different words in the Greek as they are in the English. You're puffed up in 5-2. And you are... Self-inflated with uh, importance. Yeah, really, your own importance. Li literally, yeah. And in verse 6, you're... Uh, your boasting, your celebrating, your, uh, is not your kalchema, your, your, your celebrating is not good. Don't you know that it only a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? As you said, Rick, he's concerned for the well-being and unity of the entire church here. There are really two issues, the inward look and the outward appearance. There's the issue of fragmentation among the congregation, as, you, as you've mentioned. And then there's the issue of how people outside in the big bad world out there are going to see this group as well. Um, Paul, I suspect, is reserved about disfellowshipping people. Uh, this is really the only explicit reference we have. Mm -hmm. But one of the triggers may be when it's damaging the body of Christ's unity inside or its uh, respectability from the outside view. Either of those, I think, would be a sufficient. And, and I think we just have to say this is a justice that's not merely retributive. It is restorative. Exactly. It's meant to be yeah. restorative. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's not Paul just wanting him to suffer because he's maybe made life miserable for other people. Yeah. But there is a principle here. I, I was talking to someone not long ago who uh, found out what I do, teach religion, and uh, uh, immediately started talking about his own perspective on religion, and he described himself as not a religious person, and the reason he gave was because of some of the things he knew uh, yeah. about the lives of people who claimed to be religious. People who were, let's mm -hmm. say, uh, leaders of churches, and yet at the same time had uh, certain financial activities on their own that uh, seemed to be in conflict with Christian principles. So we, 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 we can't deny the fact that the way Christians behave communicates to the world whether or not the uh, Christianity really has validity and integrity and is worth hanging on to. I think in the church it's so easy for people who are not uh, in tune with God mm -hmm. and they see somebody who's supposed to be a wonderful Christian and they see this and this and this that they're doing they say, well, see, that's right. look at them. I'm better than they are. I'm not doing that. And he's supposed to be a Christian. Well, that's the problem. So here. therefore, yeah. this is what he's saying. You've got yeah. to get rid of that man. Well, I, I mean, you can imagine people saying, well, if, if that's the way Christians behave, yeah. you know, there's I don't nothing there to for do us. With them. Yeah, why yeah. should we care about them? Exactly. It is interesting, I think, generally, and this may have to do with this man's background, I think generally Jews were admired in the uh, mm -hmm. classical world because mm -hmm. of their high standards yeah. of morality. Pagans, pagans yeah. were attracted. Yeah. yeah. And, Maybe and grudgingly a little, well, but, but nonetheless. Uh, there seemed to have been, uh, shall we call them, uh, Gentile women who were part of these Jewish congregations because they admired the high level of morality. And so you can imagine how upset Paul would be yes. to say you're, 
you're, you know, you're blowing our good image right sure, out of the water here. Sure. Well, you remember the God fears, the Gentile God yes. fears, those who That's made an I approach uh -huh. to the synagogue and they maybe kept the Sabbath in some way and paid some money to the synagogue. Yeah, and this, this whole thing explodes the very meaning of, as you said, of community. It's amazing. Could a little you go leaven. ahead and read yeah. on the rest here because we only have a little over a minute left. Okay, well, uh, you wanted me to read, yeah, uh, read it? Yeah, Okay, ahead. verse 7. Clean out the old yeast that you may be a new batch, as you really are unleavened. For our paschal lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the festival not with the old yeast. The yeast is supposed to go mm -hmm, before, mm -hmm. before you, the celebration, and he's already been crucified. Not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Yeah. Okay. With verse 11, but now I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, or a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. With such a man do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Now, we only have a little time left, yes. so we're going to continue on. That's not the end of the story. <laughs> That's not the end, because Jesus has a way of saying, let's do what we can to bring him back. Yeah. All right? right? Yeah. Okay, this is Carolyn Thompson for Searching for Answers, and we hope that you have been listening to this story, because unfortunately... There's a lot of immorality going on, not just outside the church, but inside the church too. Why is this? Because Satan is working so hard to tempt them so he can claim them for his own. And until next time, this is Carolyn. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>